in Charleston and know anything. I wish I never came to Charleston. Um, it has been a nightmare, I'm sure, for them as much as it is for me. He's stammering. He's standing here. He picked up the wine bottle. He had it reversed twice. Would you go hurt someone else? Are you kidding me? I mean, well, you would agree you're a pathological liar. Correct? No, I would not. No. No, I would not. Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we're gonna talk about a train, which is fitting. It's fitting because this, this story is kind of like a journey. See, it's all coming together. Kate Waring was a matchmaker. Though when I say a matchmaker, I really mean she lit a match that would end not great for her. She came from a wealthy family, loved traveling, but on one train journey she would make a friend who did nothing but whole Kate went lies. You got the fraud, you got the money, you got the match made in H-E double hockey sticks, and then you got it all ending in kind of uh, 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 the most unpleasant way. Let's give it a go. It all began on the Palmetto train, and a train ran by Amtrak, and it goes from New York City all the way down to Savannah, Georgia. It runs for 829 miles through Washington, D.C., Richmond, Fayetteville, Charleston, before ending on down in Georgia, boy! It takes about 15 hours to do the whole thing. 23 stops. But a tall redhead, 28 years old, name of Kate Waring, was not doing the whole thing. That morning in May 2009, she was going from Washington, D.C., and she'd be getting off home down in Charleston, South Carolina. Kate was a daughter of the South, growing up in a wealthy family that could trace its lineage back generations in the area. Her parents, Tom and Janice, only ever had one daughter, Kate, and she was the apple of their eye, as you can imagine. Or maybe you can't, so I don't know. Kate had two brothers, one younger, one older, and she was someone who was gonna get out there and do shit. School, not really for her. She was smart, too smart to be taught she had to do. She was kind, you know, she cared for those uh, around her, especially if she saw somebody who was, who was vulnerable. And you know, it was the same like with animals. When she saw a stray, she had to, you know, take care of it. Now, it wasn't all roses for Kate. Her family would later learn that she'd actually been sexually abused when she was a kid by, by a family friend, and then as she got older, she would develop, you know, issues, uh, eating disorders, depression, and she would turn to alcohol as a coping me mechanism, and she was kind of just a little bit all over the place. I mean that physically, too, as, you know, the only thing that seemed to help with all this for Kate was traveling. Traveling, it would turn out, would be just the ticket. Is that a pun, or...? At first with her dad, then on her lonesome. Moscow became a favorite place of hers. She loved the culture and the language. Really? And hence why she was in Washington, D.C. She was applying, you know, for, for a long-term visa. Now, it turned out there were some issues, paperwork, bullshit, so she was heading on back down home to, to Charleston, and she was excited. She had been taking some college classes, at the time, and yeah, she was, you know, fine. It's all good. That trip, that train journey, the Amtrak journey from DC to Charleston, it took about nine hours. Nine and a half hours. But, you know, she was, you know, be, be doing college work and that kind of thing while on the train. But during that train ride, she just so happened to end up yapping away to another person on the train. She started a conversation with another woman. A conversation that would lead to a friendship and ultimately to death. It was then, one month later, in June 2009, Kate stopped texting her parents. Now it was noticeable, like, from the start, she was daddy's girl. Like, she texted a lot. And I mean, like, a lot, a lot. And Tom Waring, he noticed. And he also noticed Kate was not really around, and it seemed like she hadn't been for a couple of days. See, Tom uh, and his wife, they were they were in like their second home just outside of Charleston at the time, so they went back to their, you know, their main house where Kate was living. And they, they walked around and they were like, where's Kate? Why isn't she here? She's not on, on her phone. They went into her room. In her room, they even saw all her prescriptions and medications were there. If Kate had planned to go away for a couple of days, 
she would have taken them. She also would have told her parents. They called her friends nothing. So then they began to think, you know, maybe has she fallen off the wagon? You know, has she fallen back into the substance abuse issues she had had previously, the one that traveling helped her kick. They called her into hospitals. They called her into jails. No one had a feisty redhead name of Kate. It was then on Monday, the 15th of June, that the family were thinking, all right, if we don't hear from Kate in a couple of hours, we are calling, we are calling up. Like, we're, we're going to make a, a, a police report, a missing persons report for Kate. But it was then that Tom got a call from Kate's bank. They were calling a bank teller because a man had come in to cash a check made out by Kate Waring. But there were two problems with it. One was that Kate only had about $100 in her account. This check was made out to for, for four and a half thousand dollars. So it's just like just a little bit, a little bit more. And second of all, the signature didn't match. It looked like it was forged. That guy's name was Ethan Mack. Now, Tom didn't know Ethan personally, but he'd heard the name from Kate, that he was a friend. But Tom called the police. Now, Ethan worked in a hotel uh, in Charleston, and he had known Kate for years. In fact, according to a few people, he was her best friend. They were super tight. They had been for years. Now, it was never a romantic uh, relationship. They were, Ethan would say, you know, they were more like siblings. You know, he was like an older brother who would always look out for her, who helped her, who had helped her through, you know, some of the issues she had gone through throughout her life. But now it seemed like he was trying to cash forged checks. But when the police confronted Ethan about like, hey, that is bullshit, he said, um, no, Kate, Kate gave me this check. She'd borrowed some money from me and this was her giving me a check to, to pay it back. So hence why, yada, yada, yada. But it still was like, I don't think she wrote this. Ethan said he had last seen Kate on, on the Friday night, the 12th of June. So the, you know, on the Friday before, this is the Monday. On the Friday before, they had gone out for dinner, they had gone out for drinks, and then he dropped her home uh, like that, that night. They had texted a bit. That was it. Shine. Now text messages backed that up, and Ethan let the police search his his home. You know, uh, just for any clues if Kate was there. Or rather, he let the police search the home he, he lived in with his mother, where he told the police was his home. So, where the hell was Kate? Her phone last pinged miles from her house. But police thought the tower closer may have just been busy, and hence why it went to the next tower, and that in fact she was probably at home, and that was that. She was 28 years of age, there was no evidence of a crime here, or foul play, she could have just gone on, you know, off by herself, and so there was nothing really for the police to do, or at least, you know, nothing to justify um, them following up with a big old missing persons investigation. Maybe she ran off to Moscow. Family, though, not convinced. I mean, she was always in contact with her parents. And now it was days and weeks since they'd last heard from her. And same with her friends. They didn't hear anything from Kate. She was seen on CCTV that day, the Friday, the day people last saw her, refilling a prescription. But she'd also spoken to her parents about some kind she feared she was getting into some kind of trouble. Now, she never, she said, elaborated on what this actual trouble was. She never elaborated on the trouble, but they kind of got a feeling that something may have been off, but they had nothing to go off of. You know, and months would go by, you know, summer would become autumn. And, and a couple of other friends would come forward and say, yeah, they had last spoken to Kate and things were weird. Uh, one person said they got a text from Kate saying she was off to Greenville to find some lovely, now she never actually said what lovely was and that she was going to be back in a few days. Obviously, she ain't back in a few days. And another friend said that, that she, Kate, Kate had told them about they were worried, Kate was worried that her identity was being stolen and that somebody was opening credit cards in her name. And so with the police not really kind of doing anything, her parents, they hired some private investigators to dig into all of these rumors and things, those about where Kate was and what had been going on in the days leading up to her disappearance. We thank police for the work they've done and said she just wants Kate back home. We feel hopeful and we've gone on for this for four months now. We're missing her so much. We dearly love her. Um, it's been heartbreaking for our family not to know where she is and um, 
I'm just hoping that something will break pretty soon now. And the tower where her phone last pinged. Now, the police quickly discarded that, saying, oh, you know, it's probably just the tower closer to her house was busy, and it just went to the next tower, it's fine. The private investigators didn't discard it, though, as quickly. They thought maybe she had been travelling in that direction, out towards these little islands and swamps. And that when her phone pinged, it had been a call to her own vo voicemail. Kate never checked her voicemail. Her voicemail was actually full, she never even checked it. And so with a bit of digging and a bit of doodling, the PIs went back to Ethan Mack, who, as we know, was the last person to see Kate alive, at least that's what he said. And so they also learned that Ethan had a girlfriend named of Heather Camp. Heather Camp had been at Kate's home before, her parents knew of her. In fact, that's why Ethan and Heather were dating. Kate had introduced them, she'd been a matchmaker. Heather Camp was also the woman Kate struck up a friendship with as she went on a train from DC back to Charleston. They had become fast friends, especially after Heather told Kate, you know, during this train journey that, you know, she was moving to Charleston, she was on the train because she was starting a new job, she was a pedi pediatric surgeon, and she was starting a new job in a hospital in Charleston, but hadn't she just been robbed? Didn't have a penny to her name. And didn't Kate, well, oh, Loveheart's kind of like strewing her eyes like, oh, I'll take care of you. I get you. And so now Heather, she was living uh, with Ethan in an apartment after Kate introduced them. Kate said, hey, Ethan's my longtime best buddy pal. And Heather, you're my new best buddy pal. Plink. And so Heather now was living with Ethan in an apartment the police never searched because Ethan lied to the police, saying that he lived with his mother when he didn't, did not live there. No, sir. And so the private detectives who were searching around for everybody around Kate and the last people. You know, if Ethan had been the last pe person to, to see Kate, maybe Heather had too. Possible? And they also learned a little bit about Heather. Who? <laughs> hmm. She was a con artist. And Heather and her eyebrows had been arrested for forgery in numerous states and had no medical licenses, degree, or anything. Was she actually going to work in the pediatric department of a children's, you know, hospital? Was she far? But I mean, you know, as soon as you hear, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I help sick children. Yeah, I mean, come on. What are you, you're immediately going to go. Yeah, it's hard to top that. Heather Camp had even just recently been arrested for taking a blood sample of a six-year-old girl she'd been babysitting. Heather Camp has no medical, I don't, she was arrested for assault. And what, well, what Heather Camp's usual kind of modus operandi, let me use the big words, was to meet a man, meet a buccal, then move in with him, fleece him for pretty much everything he had, then get in a huge amount of death, debt, leave him in that debt, rinse and repeat. She would tell people, you know, she was the daughter of royalty, of, of a, a mafia, a, you know, was related to the mafia, all this sorts of shite, pure shite, weird as all shite. Though her biggest crime was this picture. And now with a convicted fraudster, you know, entering the picture, this forged check kind of makes like a lot more sense. Kate made friends with Heather on a train, Heather, full-time liar, and then Heather gets involved with Kate's best friend, Ethan. Then Kate disappeared. It would also turn out that that dinner, you know, Ethan said dinner, drinks he'd went to uh, with Kate on the Friday night, the night when she was last seen alive, the bill for that was like, it's a lot of food, as in maybe more for three people, not two. Heather was probably there at that dinner also. And then Ethan lied to the police about where he lived, of all things. I hear you're barking, big dog. Shit be shady. So the PIs took it, took all of this to the police, and they said, look at all of this shit. There's something seriously wrong going on here. Her, her, her best friend and his new girlfriend are really weird, and like, no, this is no bueno. The police, though, had, they still had no interest in this. And so the PIs started watching Ethan and Heather themselves. They even set up like a little camera looking at uh, Ethan's house, and they found that, that, or his apartment, and they found that, that when Ethan was going to work Heather, she was off riding a neighbor. It would be months later, where essentially P.I. is doing all of the legwork that Ethan and Heather would be arrested and charged with forgery, the Kate wearing check. 2009, Fugitive from Justice, and then 
Judge Linda Lombard said it was their criminal record that convinced her Ethan Mack and Heather Camp should get a high bond. She called the couple dangerous. Camp, the judge says, is a fugitive in four states with a second-degree robbery conviction. Mack said to have a couple of drug charges and one gun charge from 07 that is still pending. Mack's lawyer used his slim criminal record and the fact that he's from here and has roots here as a reason why he is not a flight risk. But the judge didn't buy it. Um, the bond on each count is $100,000. Each of you has two counts. The total bond is $200,000. I, I, I met her as Angelica Walker. Steve Perry says Angelica is the same woman we know as Heather Camp. He says she's used several names. Perry hasn't been contacted by Charleston authorities and wonders why. He says she wrote a check on his account in Indiana, then tried to pay him back with a check stolen from a different account. She wrote it to me to pay for the check that she had stolen from me. Perry calls her a pathological liar who clearly needs help. At the time of her arrest in Charleston, Camp reportedly claimed to be pregnant. Perry tells me she's lied about being pregnant many times, but he says she does have two children, a boy and a girl. And she went to take me to meet them, and that's when I realized that this it was a foster parent that brought the children to a supervised visitation. The foster care situation, he said, she tried to cover up. Another cover-up, he says, the claim she was a nurse. And that is when things began to crack. See, Ethan, you know, at his bond hearing for this forgery case, which is serious business, no joke. Ethan was there. His family was there. He had, like, family friends, top local defenders, all there out to bat for him. Heather had no one. She was there by herself. And with her record, she would need a speedboat to get out of Shit Creek. And so the police were, went to her. The PIs went to her. They all went to her and said, What happened to Kate? What happened to Kate? have him on what? A forgery? And if he gets out, do you know what happens to me? You think he's getting out right now? No. <laughs> I mean, come on. I'm not getting out. What do you think where he's going to bond out? Heather, what you're telling me is he killed her. He killed her and he hid the body. The question is, where did he kill her right now? I don't know where he killed her. It didn't happen on, on uh, did. Riley Road? No, it did not happen on Riley Road. No, it did not. You had every you had every chance you had every chance to come clean when we brought you in over here. You didn't. You didn't. I asked for And I'm supposed to believe that it was because you were so afraid of Ethan. That's why you couldn't tell me. Come on, Heather. How much more is there? Alright, you're telling he killed her. Alright, he killed her. It was an accident, it was an accident. If you freaked out, you didn't know what to do, you didn't know what to do. I still love him. No what. Heather told them an island where Kate's body had been dumped. She told them the pawn shops where they'd sold her jewelry, and she told them where they could find a few more things hidden in their apartment. She pointed them towards Wadmala Island. You'd pass through James Island on your way there. And it was there they found the bones of Kate Waring, or rather, the private investigators did, once again. No one with the address of emergency. Yes, ma'am. This is Robert Minter. Okay, you need police fire or EMS, sir? Police. What, what's the address, hun? Wait, there's no address. It's in the woods. What, what, we found the body of um, Kate Waring. You believe you found the body of Kate Waring? Yes, we yes. know we did. In the woods? Yes. Hello? Hey, Sarge. Mm -hmm. You ready for this? No. This guy is adamant that he found Kate Waring in the woods off of Polly Point Road. Off of where? Polly Point Road in Guatemala Island. Alright. How's he out of it? Uh, he says he Heather would take a deal. She would plead, plead guilty to murder, you know, for a reduced sentence and would testify against Ethan Mack, saying, you know, they had both killed her, but it had been Ethan who had dealt, you know, the killing blow. Heather, what we were wanting to do now is have you show us uh, where the suitcase was, where Catherine was when uh, Ethan struck her with the wine bottle. Okay, Kate was still in the suitcase. The case was open. Um, grabbed the wine bottle. Came back around here. I, I moved. I mean, I'm standing here. He's, you know, he's standing here. 
he picked up the wine bottle, he had it reverse twice for the first two times. Um, it, you could hear like a crunch, but the bottle didn't break. The third time was the time that the bottom of it broke, but the top part was still intact. He lifted her out and put her on the thing, and then I helped him drag the, the blanket that she was on from the, the living, had to live room floor into the kitchen where she was laying this way. And she, in the bathroom, he had already put the bags over her feet and her, um, her head. So, um, from that point, a couple of hours until the morning, he went to the store and got the other stuff. I don't remember which store it was. He got the mop, the, the OxyClean stuff, two pairs of gloves and stuff. Um, he, um, we cleaned the inside of the house, the walls, the bathroom, everything. While she was still on the kitchen yes, floor? Yes, sir. The problem with that, though, is that Heather was not exactly the most reliable person in the world. Kind of a history of being a con artist <laughs> will they do that to you. And also a lot of the legwork done by the PIs was not admissible because they didn't get, you know, the court, the warrants and the court orders to be able to do all this shit, to be able to do the surveillance and yada yada yada. And Ethan, he never changed his story. He said, you know, yeah, they'd gone out for dinner, they'd gone out for drinks, he had dropped her off home, and that was it. You understand that you're being charged with obstruction of justice and forgery? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. You've not been charged with murder. No, I put that on me, not yet. But it's kind of. Not necessarily. Obstruction of justice. I ain't fool with you, no check. You can take a handwriting sample, whatever. I ain't fool with you, no check. Listen. The obstruction of justice charge is a 10 year charge. 10 years. I know, that's a long time. That's a long time. 25 years is a long time, one year is a long time, two years is a long Thank time. Thank you. Thank you. We don't want to do this. Obstruction of justice. Obstruction of justice was when you lie regarding an investigation. It's that simple. It's that simple. Who's telling Who's the truth? Everything no, who on Who's telling the truth? Are you, you said, lying, you or, said, is it, or is Angelica lying? Lying about what? Well, Angelica is telling us a story that's completely so opposite of yours. You just put so it, who's you lying? Said, yeah, I can blow up. Yeah, I blow up sometimes. So yeah, who's I lying? Man, Are you lying, so, or is Angelica lying? Who lying? I'm you lying. tell me I'm who's lying. lying. So Angelica's a liar. Well, I'm not a Angelica's you pointing her finger at you, you saying that you did it. Well, wherever you can see how it is. I'm not saying it. Angelica is. The story never made sense either. I mean, you could see possibly why Heather would want Kate dead, but why Ethan? He had been her best friend for years. What would he have, you know, against her? To, well, against her by like, kind of like, quite a lot to kill her. A motive for Heather was discovered. Remember how Kate had told a friend about she was worried about getting in some kind of trouble and that somebody was impersonating her, stealing her identity, and was, uh, you know, opening credit cards in her name? Well, a letter was found from Kate to a friend saying that it was Heather who was impersonating her and that she had threatened to get her parents involved who were, you know, had a lot of De Niro's. And so they, you know, Heather would be up shit creek, essentially, if this came out. So perhaps that's why Heather killed her to steal her identity. To do what she had done to men for years and years and years, only this time she would make it a bit more permanent with Kate. But Ethan, was he involved? I mean, it would seem unlikely he would be unaware of what his girlfriend, who actually became his wife, was doing. Well, the deal Heather took, she was saying he did it all. She would testify that to prevent her from stopping the scam, after the dinner and drinks, he drove Kate over to his place, tricked her into getting inside a suitcase, stun gunned her, torturing her, hit her over the head with a wine bottle, and then drowned her in the bathtub before dumping her in the swamp. At the end of Ethan's trial, the jury were undecided. It resulted in a mistrial. He did get 15 years for the forgery, but would have to stand trial again for what had happened to Kate Waring. As for Heather Camp, her story was all, all over the place. She changed her story as often as you change your socks. If you do that a lot, I, I don't know, who am I to judge? And so, the plea deal was revoked, and she eventually pleaded guilty to murder and was sentenced to 39 years in prison. 
As for Ethan, rather than go through another murder trial, Ethan took an Alfred plea. Do you understand that the court still treats this as a guilty plea? Yes, ma'am. And that your criminal record will reflect it as a guilty plea? Yes, ma'am. He was accepting a conviction of voluntary manslaughter. An Alfred plea, you know, was when you don't admit guilt, but you do say, okay, the evidence here, that would not end well for me. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. A lot of people, including the prosecutor, the judge, the family, all believe you were the mastermind of this murder. Were you? No, I was not. But today in court, and I'm going back to what the prosecutor had to say, the prosecutor said that this was, and I'm using her words, this was your kill. This was the Heather Camp show and that this was Heather Camp's kill. They couldn't get Ethan because I lied or else they would have got him for murder and they most likely would have. So place the blame all on me. Did you tase her? Did you beat her? Did you put her head under the water? I mean, what did you physically do that night? All I did was turn on the water. So that wasn't your motivation in it, to try to protect yourself from being caught stealing money? I, I don't understand what you mean by that. I mean, did you kill her because you were afraid someone was going to come arrest you for trying to steal Kate Waring's money? Uh, no. Why did you kill Kate Waring? Why did we kill Kate Waring? Um, I mean, well, you would agree you're a pathological liar. Correct? No, I would not. But don't you do that? I don't do that. Um, you did throughout this whole trial, though. Right? I mean, I've, I lied. I lied to help my husband, yes. But sometimes I didn't knowingly lie. And so was the end uh, of Kate Waring. You know, somebody who trusted both you know, her best friend and his new girlfriend. And in turn, they murdered her simply out of greed. Simply for, because all they got out of murdering her, other than you know, the motive of killing her before she got her parents involved. They actually didn't get anything, now that I think about it, because the check, the four and a half grand check, which is not really a lot for killing somebody, well, he couldn't actually cash that when he tried to. All they got was whatever they could pawn. Um, her jewelry, and that kind of shit, which probably couldn't have been a lot. And you know, we still don't really know what happened. Both Ethan and Heather still point the finger at each other, that the other killed Kate that they both indeed were stealing from her, but they were each horrified by what the other was doing when they murdered Kate. But they were just too in love to, you know, uh, stop them from torturing Kate Waring to death before dumbing her body in a swamp. But whether we will ever know what they actually did to Kate Waring, well, we don't know. But what we do know is that both, and I'll tell you this for free, are huge sacks of shit. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, watching this little video with me. It, it always means so much to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, here, listen, I guess that kind of like wraps this whole one up. So I'll see you in a couple of days um, with another story. It'll be, I don't know what the next one will be, but we'll see. No spoilers. But until then, please, as always, take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. Mike out. <laughs>